All right, everyone. Um, my name is Brenda Musa, uh, and I work with Plaque. We really like to thank USAID Skill uh, for supporting this webinar series. Um, it is the second part of Plaque's webinar series on policy advocacy and engagement. This webinar series is themed best practices in legislative engagement. The objective of this webinar is to examine best practices that increase citizen opportunities to exercise their democratic rights to participation in governance, governance decisions that affect them. At this webinar series, that will be facilitated by two experienced development experts, uh, one from PLAC, PLAC's program manager on legislative and gender issues, Nkiri Uzodi, and Dr. Fabinro and Byron, a development and institutional reform expert of so many years. PLAC will share practical experiences from its engagement with the National Assembly over the years in addition to recommendations and best practices from other jurisdictions that may increase citizens' interactions with the legislature and a more inclusive democracy. Um, like I said, we would really like to thank USAID Skill for its support. And please do fill the attendance sheet, which has been provided at the chat column. At the end of the webinar, we would also be placing an evaluation link for you to give us feedback on how helpful the webinar series was. Thank you very much. And I'll be handing over to the first facilitator who will be taking part one um, in Kiri Uzodi. Thank you very much. Sorry, Brenda, Kiri, just before you start, I, don't, I can see Ilya is here. I don't know if he wants to speak. Good morning, um, Omolara and uh, all participants here. Yeah. Just to reiterate that, I mean, we, we are in full support of um, uh, what Black is doing, and will encourage full participation. And um, let's 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 be open to learn and and put into practice what what we are learning. I mean, there are a number of advocacy issues that we can that we can pursue as um, civil society uh, advocates, and uh, it's good to learn from the um, the experts what they have um, for us. So let's 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 be um, be attentive and let's let's try and participate. Use the chat box as much as we can, uh, and, and and let's let's be engaging all through the process. Thank you. Thank you, Ilya. Thank you for that, and thank you for the support. Good morning. Um, okay, so I think I'm just going to just start without uh, further ado. I'm going to share my screen. Good morning again. I think um, Brenda already. Um, explained um, the objectives uh, of this webinar. So I think there's no point going through it all again. Um, but, um, you know, I just put it up on the slides, um, you know, just as part of the preamble. Um, please, I, I just need feedback that someone is hearing me. Brenda, can you hear me? Um, I just need confirmation that I'm being heard. In Kuru, we are hearing you loud and clear. Okay, very thank you very much. There was uh, silence, which is good. Yes, I know. Sure. We are trying to pay attention. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Dr. Shino. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, like, like I mentioned, thank you. Brenda already um, shared the webinar objectives. And so this presentation format, uh, format uh, um, I put it up on the screen. So I'll be starting and then Dr. Shino will, will continue. And so the way we structure our presentation, you know, there are certain parts that he will elucidate. Um, um, we're speaking on the same topic, but of course, bringing different um, perspectives to it. So there are certain area parts of our presentation that I'm not going to focus on because I know he has expertise in that area and I'll highlight it as we go along. So, um, of course, um, um, I'll start, you know, with an introduction to the legislature. So we had a webinar uh, before this last week, and um, I don't know if some of the participants who were there, who are here today were at that webinar, but I know, you know, we need some introduction to the legislature, but, you know, just for the sake of preamble, you know, we all know what legislature stands for. It's a symbol of democracy, the highest policymaking organ of government and hub of popular participation. Uh, legislators represent the interests and aspirations of different constituencies. They are seen as the arm that is closest to the people. So um, I feel that is why you know this this topic 
is at, um, very important to citizens and civil society organizations. Um, and again, you know, when we talk about legislative engagement, you know, it's basically a form of citizen participation. You know, it simply means being involved in public decision making and influencing gov uh, governance decisions. And uh, a public engagement with legislature is really key to Nigeria's democratic health. So why engage? You know, I put a recap here because again, you know, we, we had a webinar last week and you know, that was uh, what we focused on really why do people engage? So generally, um, like I mentioned, you know, active citizens are crucial for our democracy. Um, engagement is really important for, for um, building an accountable and transparent legislature. Um, improving your understanding of the role of the National Assembly, inclusive and representative decision making. I'm not going to go into details, but you know, I just outlined it, you know, just as a recap and a refresher. Uh, but in more specific terms, really, why do people engage the legislature? In our own case, the Nigerian National Assembly. Um, and you know, I'm, and I'd like to note, you know, any reference I need to legislature, uh, please note, you know, that's a reference to the Nigerian National Assembly at the federal level and also to the state houses of assembly, because I'm aware that. Um, some of our participants also work at the state and not everybody is working in the National Assembly. So in more specific terms, um, you know, we engage the National Assembly to make inputs to, um, to the legislative agenda, to help drive lawmaking, to recommend changes to laws, propose new laws, um, uh, facilitate communication between elected reps and their constituents. And you know, lawmakers really benefit when citizens engage and voice their opinion. It's very, very important for them uh, in taking or gaining the pulse of the community and in making better uh, policy decisions and solving their constituents' um, problems. So, of course, there's also the awareness aspect of it and also imputing to oversight of the executive, which um, constitutionally is a role that belongs to the legislature. Um, um, so in this topic, um, you know, I remember when Brenda was telling me she talked about best practice, you know, best practice for legislative engagement. And, you know, best practice is a term that is commonly used. I'm sure most of us know what, what it means. So from there, I just basically crafted the question which this session is going to seek to answer. How do we ensure that we are effectively, effectively engaging our representatives and what are the best practices for legislative engagement and advocacy? When we talk about best practice, you know, we're talking about a set of guidelines ethics or ideas that represent in an efficient or the most efficient or prudent course of action. So it's um, usually best practice refers to, you know, methods that have proven to be effective, methods that have been tried and tested or, or a benchmark. So in this case, when we talk about best practice for legislative engagement, I'm talking about, you know, the standards used for engaging democratic um, parliaments. Um, but, um, you know, based on experience working with National Assembly, you know, I, I wouldn't want to just refer to best practice, you know, I also, Think we should also think about a best fit approach, um, and you know when we talk about best fits, then it means we are you know talking about focusing on on strategies um, that can help us align our action um, be, uh, best you know best with the environments that we are operating. You know we work in Nigeria. You know there's a local context and circumstances, and in doing that, you know political analysis is useful here. This is a topic. Um, that is going to come up later in the presentation. So I'm really, really going to be focusing on my my presentation will focus on you know, giving sharing tips and best practice and best fit approach for CSOs who are engaging or planning to engage the National Assembly and state legislatures. It's going to be a mix of you know, uh, standards for democratic parliaments and also pa uh, practical experience that we've had as CLAC engaging the Nigerian National Assembly, which you know, I believe it's um, uh, some of this experience. You can only get it you know, when you've really engaged uh, your local context so um, your strategy approach for engagement really really have, has to match the context um, so what i did to make this very easy is to kind of use keywords so when you talk about best practices there's really a lot there's a lot of material and content on engaging legislatures or parliaments worldwide so and you know i think you know the whole day it's not enough to go through all that so what i've done is to just put them in abc so i have 10 tips that i'm going to share so i put them um you know as abc 10 a to j 1 to 10 and so every time going to the same is going to fall under those um, those headings so the first one adopt a goal and assess the environment build knowledge See, craft a solid engagement strategy, D, define a communication strategy, E, engage effectively and efficiently, F, foster collaboration and partnerships, G, give reliable evidence, uh, H, have a long-term perspective, 
I identify quick wins, outcomes, and lessons learned, J, jettison, partisanship, rivalry, et cetera. So getting right to it. Um, so adopt a goal and assess environment. So to engage the legislature of National Assembly, you really have to start with a goal for a legislative advocacy. So yeah, different, you can have different goals. It could be to campaign for a new legislation. It could be a campaign or advocacy for amendments of, um, of a legislation. And you know, it's really important when you're setting this goal to ask certain questions. For instance, I, I put a question, can you lobby? What does your, your donor organization say? very, very clear about lobbying or about um, supporting legislation or you know, taking a position on certain issues and in fact I remember in one of the cases you know there was some campaign we were doing with another organization and they were very very clear that they couldn't do a call to action um, so they couldn't tell people to to act a certain way or go a certain direction but for platform our organization you know it promotes um, legislation you know we can provide support to it and we can issue calls, calls to action so i think your your organizational policy should really really uh, come into play here and uh, depending if you're working on a project you know your donor rules are really really important um uh, in defining your goal or what you can do when you are doing legislative advocacy so you know also um outline other um types of goals you know, you know, your goal could just be informing legislators. It could just be providing technical support and not necessarily running a campaign. It could just be improving a relationship with reps and that's facilitating um, discussion platforms uh, between elected representatives and, um, and uh, their constituents. It could just be awareness building. You just want people to know what's happening. And then it could just be budget monitoring or tracking. And um, of course, your advocacy objective, you know, you have your objective and you have your goal. You should have a goal which is more short term. And of course, the goal is more long term. You know, usually what's your hopes accomplished yeah, between three to five years. And of course, remember the SMART criteria for setting objectives that it should be specific, measurable, achievable, achievable realistic, um, and time bound. Then um, assessing your environment, I think that's also very, very important. Um, and I, you know, uh, usually when we talk about assessing the environment, most of us we think about the external environment or the environment to operate alone. But I think it's very important to also do an internal assessment. You know, what are your organizational strengths um, and capacity? Um, what resources do you have? You need resources to work. Um, how are your internal processes? If you are getting donor funding, of course, you need to have a good documentation on reporting and financial management. What is the extent of your political? access and influence what partnerships and networks you have and the reason why i outline this is because it's knowing your capacity and strength will help you develop um, an engagement and strategy that fits and i'll give you results it will also inform um, you or inform you uh, your strategy on the type of partners um, that you need uh, to engage uh, to build strength or to leverage and uh, then of course the external environment you know knowing the political landscape is essential. You know, it's important to know the legislative history of a particular issue. Um, if something, if you are trying to get into an area or get into um, or engage or campaign for a particular, it's important to know. You know, if you didn't, didn't swear, yeah, uh, who were the supporters, who were the opponents, was the political context. You know, NAS is a political institution, not the politicians. You know, a PEA. There's something we, we do also as part of. Um, our planning, which is a political economy analysis. I'm going to allow Dr. Shinov to really speak further on this because this is really his area of specialty, but it's very useful for doing legislative advocacy engagements. It's really a structured approach for analyzing how change happens. It helps you see beyond the surface um, and it helps you understand the changing political context and making an informed decision. So, I mean, these are when we talk about the kind of things you map. And talking about culture, ideology, you know, these are factors that really prevent decision makers and legislators from supporting um, advocacy campaigns. I think the same also goes for the states. You know, you really need to understand the political dynamics um, in your state. Then, um, the, going to the B, build knowledge, be informed. This cannot be overemphasized. You cannot, you know, engage an institution that you know nothing about. Um, you have to understand the police that the National Assembly or legislators have a political side and they have a bureaucracy. So these are two distinct parts. They are connected, but these two components of the National Assembly, they are, you know, 
they work together, you know, to do all the work. You know, the politicians cannot work without the bureaucrats or the support staff. So it's really, really important that you understand that, you know, of course, when we talk about the political, um, political composition, we're referring to the NAS leadership. I'm sure you know who they are, the Senate president, speakers, and the rest, and the legislators. And you have to know your legislators. I put the National Assembly website there, so, um, and the link, um, so you can go there, you know, and see who is presenting you legislators, their committee assignments, and um, re relevant information. Then understanding formal and informal power structures in the National Assembly. Again, this links to the political economy analysis, which, you know, I'm uh, hoping Dr. Shino will elaborate on. Um, again, you have to know the political position and inclination of the legislators, track their bills, motions, their public statements. You have to track their political history. And then, of course, when you talk about the NAS bureaucracy, you talk about the clerk of the National Assembly, who is like the chief accounting officer, also a very powerful figure and a very powerful position and very, very influential. You have the clerk of the two chambers, you have the clerk of the Senate, the House, you have com committee clerks and secretary staff. Really, if you really want to do sustained legislative engagement, you cannot do it without engaging the bureaucracy. It's, it's not going to work. I uh, just put it up there. Um, then understanding legislative process, you know, not know the, le the relevant legal framework. So um, the constitution, for instance, outlines legislative procedures. The procedure for passing bills actually in the constitution, budget approval, constitution amendment, impeachment, everything relating to legislature is a constitution. Then consult the rules of the house. I cannot overstate this. Um, the Senate has its own rules uh, standing orders. The same thing with the house of reps. I think the state rules govern the procedure of of assemblies. So, and that is where their committees are set up. That is also where the relevant mandates of uh, committees are set up, uh, their oversight mandates uh, and the rest of it, you know, even detailed procedure for passing bills and, and conducting uh, legislative work. So again, you can not really do sustained journalism engagement really on, on mandates of each committee because a lot of engagement with the National Assembly does not happen at the top level. Most engagement happens at committee level because that is the, like, the end of but that is where the nitty gritty of legislative work happens. So you really have to know the committee that has oversight over the area of work or the subject matter that you are advocating. Then, uh, of course, tracking legislative activities and documents, the other paper, which basically outlines the legislative business for the day, votes and proceedings. We have this on Plaque website. We upload it every day. Uh, these are the official records on minutes of legislative proceedings. Um, so your, the report on bills, if you're tracking a bill, if you want to know the motions your reps uh, have, uh, have uh, uh, put forward, they are presented on the floor, uh, you get that from the votes and proceedings. The hand side is actually more detailed. It contains um, verbatim reports of um, legislative proceedings and debates. And I think you, that you have to uh, apply to the National Assembly to actually um, get that. Um, then planning around the legislative calendar is key. That's something that is very, that we really utilize in our work. You have to know at the, the times that they're on recess, when they go on the annual um, holiday or annual recess and, uh, and the rest of it. And uh, of course, for those of us working in the National Assembly, you know that the legislative calendars are very, very few. They change. For instance, during the primaries, you know, most of them went off. And then we know that towards the end of the year, September, October is the budget season. But it doesn't present the budget because they need to pass it before the year. So if you are doing budget work, that, those are the periods you need to pay attention to. You know, their seasons are kind of where legislative activities or plenaries low peak, and they have the periods where activities really high peak. So you really, if you want um, to really be effective, you have to plan around that. And then doing a needs assessment of baseline study. This is really important if you are working on a very a specific area and you need to understand what has been done. Um, but, you know, I have to say that uh, a lot of people, you know, a lot of people work here, it's possible that someone must agree. Um, then secret is an engagement strategy. So when we talk about a strategy, I'm talking about a roadmap. You know, your strategy should tell you how to move from A to B. Um, you know, it's broader in scope than a plan. Then the plan should be the final details, more short term. So this is where you outline the who, the how, the when, um, of how to, and the how to achieve your goal or objective. You should involve clear rules and, um, uh, and responsibilities, you know, allocation of resources. You know, I saw this interesting quote on the internet. It says a strategy without a plan is a story of
fulfill and share also a plan alone wonders in blessing. So you really have to have an agenda like can do it or just ad hoc. There is a public hearing, something like that, and then really no um, direction or roadmap of what you can do your advocacy. You have different approaches to engage in the situation. You don't have to do whatever that person is doing. So uh, um, uh, the overseas development institutes kind of you know identify two major advocacy approach approaches. One is a cooperative inside track approach. So and for them, when they talk about this, they talk about you know they, they use the term whispering when you whisper at the government. So it involves things like advising, lobbying, uh, technical assistance, expert support, capacity building. So usually people who organizations that adopt this approach tend to um, should I say provide more support um, and you know seek kind of closer partnership or engagements and you really don't see like open confrontation. You know, this is a, an approach that we rely very heavy on in my organization. And there's also the confrontational outside track approach, you know, active in protests, petitions, work on legal action. And you know, I have to know that both approaches are very, very valid, but consistency is that it's, it's, it's advisable because you know, sometimes people just swing between the two. We are working, for instance, on a bill that is very, very sensitive and you are doing some kind of engagement or technical assistance. And then the next thing you switch you know, without doing the inside work or doing your consultation, you just switch immediately to legal action. So I think consistency is very key and it's also good for building for building strengths, you know, having an, an identifiable niche and legitimacy. So people really know what your area of special assistance organizations for think tanks, their job is to produce research. That's what they are primarily known for. It doesn't mean that organizations are just packed in one corner, one approach. Yeah, the approaches can vary, but it's really important to have a niche or an identifier. And of course, this approach should align again with your capacity. What are you able to deliver? And you know, your Go, um, here, you know, when we talk about engagement strategies, really, what, what, how do you know your, your strategy is good? Or your potential is effective. You use people's actions in the same direction to create scale and momentum. And then you can test it, you know, um, against this if then statement this is something I use in my work. You know, it, it's kind of a, a hypothetical or conditional statement. For instance, you know, if we get more citizens informed about making good voting choices because an informed citizenry is critical for electing accountable leaders inclusive governance. This is like, uh, you know a thing of, of planning approach and planning your, your engagement strategy. Then of course <coughs> excuse me then defining your communication strategy. Um, of course, I, I don't think this needs to be said. Um, having a well-defined communication strategy is key for legislative advocacy and, and engage, uh, engagement. So, you know, I just outlined a few do's there. You know, we have to understand your audience. Legislators have varied backgrounds. They have their people with different levels of academic backgrounds, different qualifications. You have a very, who have very good, high academic qualifications, people who have PhDs, you have people who are professors, you have, you have people who have a civil society background, you have people who have military uh, background, and then you have people who, uh, you know, maybe uh, just, just first degree is, you know, their highest qualification, people who are doing trading, business. I think in the National Assembly, there's even one time that somebody who once worked, who was a mechanic or something along those lines, once won election into the National Assembly. And it doesn't mean the person is less intelligent, you know, it just means the experiences are very, very, very different. So when you're doing a communication strategy, you know, you have to um, put that into consideration. Uh, and of course, it's also an audience that have very little time to read. Um, so it means your material, your awareness of communication material really has to be tailored to actually um, match their attention span, which I will tell you is very limited. Then yeah, you have to have a very clear ask or actionable items when communicating. Don't go uh, blind into a meeting with a legislator. Um, like I said, most of them do not really, really have time. So uh, having action items is easier for them to understand what exactly you want them to do make substantive contributions. If you, make, if you have submissions on a bill, you have to write it down. And um, you know, I've said this before. If you are going to a public hearing, and you know, we see this very 
uh, quite often the committees we engage with or we support uh, uh, their public hearing uh, activity. So sometimes you see um, uh, um, people submitting memos and they say, oh, um, amend the Electoral Act uh, to stop vote buying or, you know, just something couched in generic terms. Those kind of memos do not get read. They don't get read. If you are making submissions, you have to go to a particular section and say, oh, um, in section so and so, you know, this is the amendment we are proposing and replace it possible, even propose it, it draft the language, couch it, write it down. Uh, and you get a higher likelihood that such contributions will be taken um, seriously, if you provide a very clear and substantive contribution and roadmap. Then, of course, avoiding technicalities, jargon and long winded statements, um, using the media to build publicity for your advocacy campaign, complement your engagement and prevent institution is very key. But here, I have to put a caveat you have to, doing, when you're doing publicity on legislative advocacy, again, has to be well tailored. If you are doing, if you are working on a highly sensitive issue, pushing media and public campaigns without inside track engagement can be detrimental. And um, again, we've seen a lot, of, a lot of times in our work where um, sometimes you, know, you have wrong information in the media, um, so it has to be well managed. And sometimes in the course of legislative advocacy, legislative engagement, you can come um, um, across sensitive information, confidential information. Uh, and these are things you really have to weigh, as in what do you put out, what do you share, and what do you not share. This is really, really important. So it's not everything that should, you know, go out into the public, you know, being on the spotlight or get, getting some kind of media attribution really shouldn't be the ultimate aim. I mean, if that's your ultimate aim, then you have to weigh the risk and know whether you want to sustain your advocacy or you just want to do a one-off campaign and then that's it. And if you're talking about sustained engagement, if you're talking about building trust, then, um, um, you know, putting out information that are very sensitive, you know, without doing inside consultations, you know, depending could, um, uh, have backlash and it could be detrimental instead of having the desired effects that you want it to have. Um, then engaging effectively and this is now going to the needs of the actual engagement. So I have practical advice, you know, for engaging lawmakers and for engaging bureaucrats. Again, um, when engaging lawmakers have an agenda and actionable items and requests, avoid confrontation, avoid confrontation, threatening or argumentative advocacy. Uh, politicians have egos. Um, and they don't respond well, and it can actually go south, um, or, or you, can, you can take it to a place really that you, you don't like. Um, but then, even what that's not to say you can't do confrontational advocacy, but not the problem threatening. Uh, you know, you, you can be uh, firm or uh, about you know a point that you're putting across. So it needs if if you choose a confrontational advocacy as your as your approach, it needs to be measured. It needs to be strategic and not emotional. You know, without um, an end insight then seeking out champions um you know legislators who have a personal interest and natural allies you know there are people who are naturally inclined to health issues women issues pwd issues but i wouldn't make stereotypes or uh, assumptions uh, for instance well, let me give an example like working on women issues sometimes people assume that when every female legislator is interested you know, naturally want to um work only on female related or gender related issues and that's not always correct because you know, I have seen female legislators who, yes, they're interested in women issues, gender issues, but they're also very important in the hard issues like like defense, like foreign policy, um, um, like um, like uh, police issues, like security sector reform. So don't make assumptions. And uh, also another example, you know, I'll give is from the constitution um, review process, um, especially the voting process that took place in March. You know, sometimes there's this stereotype or this thinking that. Legislators from a certain part of the country do not support women issues, and legislators from a certain part of the country support women issues. And I can tell you from experience, you know, on those gender bills, there were legislators from from this one part of the country, from the north, who were really, really in support, and there were legislators from another part of the country in the south who were really, really opposed to it. So um, yes, uh, stereotypes um, and um, assumptions, you know, it's very easy to fall into them. Uh, but uh, you have to be very careful. You really have to go out of your way to find out the personal interest because you'll be really, really surprised at who will align with your cause. Maybe somebody you least expect. It's somebody you least expect. And similarly, you could uh, expect that oh, somebody um, will take up a cause. Maybe you think, oh, this person has a civil society background or the person works in the press. And then so um, he or she will support, you know, 
uh, reforms that have to do with the freedom of the press. And she may find out that the person may have some kind of um, um, misgivings about a particular issue. So it has to be backed by research uh, and evidence. Then uh, disclosing incentives. Um, sorry, I'm going to go back then. Disclose incentives that can help legislature support your advocacy. Um, E.g. media and public attribution uh, benefits to, um, to constituents. Um, I think this is really, really important because um, legislators, uh, they need to win elections, really. Uh, they need to win before their constituents. So partnership of courses that put them in good stead with, with their constituents will make them pay attention. But I had to note, please do not promise to give money. Do not give money. Again, apart from it being a breach of ethics and your donor funding terms, it's highly unsustainable. And I had to put this here because in a similar presentation uh, we had with some CSOs, this was a very, very topical issue. And there was an argument around, oh, should we give money or should you not? Do not, as in don't even, it's not something that you can finish once you start. So don't even go there. So I feel there should be zero tolerance or no go no go um, areas or issues and giving money should be one of it one of it um then when engaging bureaucrats again when you are doing legislative advocacy we require engagement with legislative staff like committee uh, committee clerks and i have seen instances where people kind of looked down on them or felt oh these people are not they are not politicians and uh, they don't have political decision making power they don't get to vote so so they are not they are irrelevant and i'll tell you that they are very 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 irrelevant a lot of legislative staff have very, very deep knowledge and experience. They have inside information that they can share. And in fact, if they are trying to gain access to an assembly, they can be a good starting point or entry point. And those of them are also very, very political savvy. But the most important thing is that they hold institutional memory of the assembly. Um, they come, uh, legislators and political aides come and go. We've seen the efficient rate in National Assembly, which is as high as 50, 60 percent. Legislators come and go, political aides. You know, they're also good to engage, they come and go, but bureaucrats, they remain, they're public servants, so they're always, always there. So when you're looking for history on an issue, history on a bill, these are the people who give you the history of a particular legislative issue or advocacy and give you tips or maybe or explanation on what, what went wrong and how you can correct, um, you know, uh, correct or try a different approach. Um, then uh, foster partnerships, network and collaboration, I think um, this is self-explanatory, you know, utilize allies and networks, we don't have, all have uh, strengths in every area, we have our strengths and we have our, our weaknesses, so it can allow for leveraging on individual strengths and even absorption of advocacy series. and what I mean here is, you know, there are certain times you may want to do something or be confrontational, but you can't, but if you are part of a group or a platform, um, you know, you can feed information or work with other groups and provide support from behind the scenes and then they can you know, take that confrontational track while you maintain your cooperative inside track. So those, that's what partnership does. You, know, you use and leverage other people's individual strengths. And overall, it's better than actually duplicating efforts and, and, and starting something new. And partnerships you know, are not limited to other civil society organizations. You, know, you can find uh, some partnership really most times about interest. So there are people who can have the same interests with you who are in other industries, who are in the corporate sector, and even government agencies, you know, with shared interests and goals, especially when you are, um, when it comes to bills, for instance. Um, I remember when we worked on the police bill, you know, that partnership with the police um, institution was really, really, because there was a shared interest and goal, so it was really important in getting the bill passed. So, for instance, if you're working on those kind of issues, issues that affect the powers or responsibilities of government agencies, and you don't have that partnership with them, you don't have that engagement with them, it's very likely that it would be a spoiler and they can throw a, a, a monkey wrench in the works. So, partnership, we talk about partnership, is not just with other CSOs. Uh, give reliable evidence. Um, you know, again, this refers to our work output as civil society. Um, when you talk about legislative engagement and advocacy, an opportunity to enlighten lawmakers. Again, knowledge is um, not infinite. Uh, your lawmakers don't know everything. Um, so engaging legislature is an, uh, is an opportunity to contribute to evidence-based lawmaking. Uh, but you have to ensure you have the sound knowledge of the subject matter of, of that particular issue. And what you know, it's important to share material, share evidence from your work. And then when you're making policy recommendations or making submissions on bills, uh, on certain issues or in hearings, you know, it's important for your arguments to be very compelling. It's important to back it with data. 
and don't just diagnose the problem, propose solutions. You know, I've gotten this feedback a lot from lots of committee clerks. People just write and just say, oh, this is a problem, but they never, there's no concrete solution at the end of the day that is of use to the committee. Um, and again, to avoid emotional arguments, again, this is also something of feedback that we've also gotten, you know, from engagement in like legislature, especially with civil society, the tendency to be emotional and think that that's enough to convince them to take a course of action. You know, sometimes all you need is just a compelling argument, data and evidence, and then you are good to go. Uh, then H, have a long-term perspective. Legislative engagement and advocacy can be tedious, very, very, very tedious. Um, there's a tendency for fatigue, there's a tendency for declining interest and weak follow-up. Like I mentioned, you know, it's very common, you see people, they attend public hearings, make contributions and then that's the end. Uh, but a lot of things people don't understand is that bills, especially, they have a long gestation period. So if you look at, you know, some of the critical bills that have been passed, like the Violence Against um, Persons Prohibitions Act, Revap Act, FOI, Freedom of Information Act, Disability Rights Act, Petroleum Industry Act. If you talk to people who did engagement or did advocacy on these bills, they'll tell you these are bills that took more than 10 years um, to pass. So um, you need to be in for the long haul if you want to sustain legislative engagement and advocacy and if you really want to have results. You know, you need a positive mindset, uh, persistence and patience. Building useful legislative relationships, they take time, they take time because, you know, there's this mutual distrust between civil society and legislators. Um, and then when you're planning your legislative engagement advocacy, you should take into consideration the four-year lifespan of an assembly. So that's part, part of what contributes to the long time. Every four years, you have a new set of individuals coming in, and a lot of times you have to start all over. So when you have trained people or done engagement on a particular bill, a particular issue, and when you come in, you find out that there's a new ch committee chair, new members, so it can be very discouraging, but you know, it's something you have to understand and work around. And again, of course, the electoral cycle, especially now that um, it's something to take note of, especially now that timelines have, have been adjusted. So now we now have primaries and we're now starting earlier. And uh, legislators, lots of them now know they're not coming back. So a lot of these things can change the dynamics and really affect the timing of your engagement. Like personally, in our own advocacy, in my organization, there are certain things we've had to put on hold because the primaries came, you know, we had to postpone them. Uh, so again, it's a marathon, not a sprint, and results are not always immediate. Um, I identify quick wins, outcomes, and lessons learned. I think this is just, you know, more of just saying, you know, give room for reflection. Give room for reflection. Yes, you could have a strategy, a plan, but it doesn't mean you cannot go back. So you should give room for evaluating for reflecting an adjustment of your strategy. And I think the reason why I inserted quick wins is I think one of the things that can keep you motivated is to celebrate small wins. Um, so a lot of times, you know, you can reach like little, little milestones. It's really, really important to acknowledge and celebrate them because it can serve as a motivation, not just for you, but also for your team and your partners. So those quick wins, yes, they may be incremental, but those, are, those may be the little building blocks you need um, to get to your larger goal. Then I think there's a final one, J, jettism, partisanship. Um, I don't think this needs to be overemphasized. Partisanship, if you're a CS or NGO doing legislative work in National Assembly, stay away from political partisanship, stay away from political affiliation. Of course, as a citizen, you have your rights. Um, you have your rights to preference of your political party. You have a right to vote and all that. But those are things that shouldn't influence your work or your decision making. Um, or your engagements. Uh, you can have committee chairs that belong to a party that you do not like or you don't respect. It still doesn't mean you have to put that aside and focus on the task at hand. And if once legislators notice that you have a very strong political affiliation partisanship, it can damage your reputation, it can damage your credibility, and it can keep you locked out. Um, then I just noted other things to avoid. Taking on too many issues or healthy competition or rivalry, I don't need to stay more civil, civil society, you know, that's something it's, it doesn't um, um, yield results. And of course, giving up, don't give up. And remember, advocacy is cyclical. Again, review, reassess, return, and restart if necessary. There's no guarantee, I mean, this is a quote I saw online, there's no guarantee that sustained effort will lead to success. But there's an absolute guarantee that a lack of sustained effort will lead to failure. So this time, these are my 10 tips. So I try to cram everything under it. I think Dr. Hoshino is going to um, uh, elaborate and add to this. Uh, but of course, I couldn't resist adding a K, which is not a bonus point. Know that this list is not exhaustive, which is exactly what I said in the beginning. You know, 
best practice for engaging legislators. Um, you know, you can uh, go online, read up material, talk to people who work in the space. You know, you can get more um, uh, get more tips. And even as you work or engage, even you come into knowledge and awareness of certain issues. You know, that may that you may not read on paper or read in a book. So yes, that may not be the end of the list, but this is the end of part one. And at this point, I'm going to say thank you very much, and I'm going to hand over to Dr. Kilo to take the part two of the presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you, as usual. That was a fantastic delivery. I always look forward to speaking after you, not before, <laughs> because there's a lot of clearing the way there. You know, thank you very much for that excellent one. Thank um, you, Dr. Shino. And I think all of us, it's, you've also delivered it in a way that will help us to remember, to yes. remember particularly the alphabetical order. Uh, just to recap a few things you said, because I don't want it to be lost. It's going to be relevant to how and what we'll say. Number one, best practices is, can be circumstantial and it is context driven. You know, Ikiru made that clear difference that, you know, best practice, it, it depends on the context, where we are, who we are engaging with, and that leads to getting to know who you want to deal with. Um, we need to know the types of the people and the parties we want to engage with. She did talk about political economy analysis, which is necessary. We have to have background, understanding. Um, the relationship between civil society and the legislature is almost like courtship and marriage. There has to, you have, civil society, we have to build trust. We have to know where we are coming from, particularly from a history of military uh, uh, rule to reluctant democracy to full democracy. And throughout, we know the role that civil society has played. So we should understand that, look, um, from the outset, um, there's a slight handicap. Civil society may be construed as the opposition. And this is the blocks that we want to dismantle consciously, gradually, and deliberately. She did also mention the issue of cooperation. You know, there are two approaches. You can be cooperative or you can be confrontational. And she said, yes, there are times to bring out, there's a they said that there's a time for everything. There's a time to bring out a sword. There's a time to bring out a flower. Um, even in our being confrontational, we should be strategic, you know. Um, she did mention asking certain questions. If this, then because. And for me, that's a theory of change. That would prove the evidence that the action that you want to take is actually going to lead to the results you want to get. So there must be a clear change there. She's also, uh, uh, well, you know, uh, she mentioned the fact that, let me just put it this way. How many people know how many legislators are? coming back, almost 160 away, which means, especially in the House of Reps, which simply means that we are going to have several new people on the block coming with their different ideas, different backgrounds, different myths or clear understanding of what the legislature should be. It behoves us as civil society to begin to start a bit of hand-holding for some of these guys. And of course, the kind of partnerships, which you will see in some of the examples you gave, and of course, she says that because it's periodic, from time to time we must reflect. If you don't measure what you do, you can't manage your success. And if you are successful once or twice, you should be able to celebrate yourself a bit. You follow me? Uh, one thing that I will also add to her is that a number of us, we have challenge uh, in dealing with either the legislature or in the public space, political space, because we want to take credit. For me, it is not about who takes the credit. When the job is done, at the end of the day, everybody takes credit. So this is, goes to our building partnerships and working collaboratively with the people we want to work with. Okay, after having done a bit of a, a, a synopsis of on uh, on uh, on the Kiru's paper. Let me share my own slide. And um, 
I hope we can see the screen, please. Can we see the screen? Yes, we can, Dr. Shuna, we can. Excellent. So this is just a continuation. And USAID for giving us this opportunity. So we want to look at the jurisdictions. The audio has been lost. Hello, Dr. Shino. I think there's something with your audio. Yeah, we can start you, hearing you. Yes, we can, can you hear me now? Yes, okay, sorry. Can. Thank you. So, okay then, let me go, go on. So, um, there are a couple of examples, particularly from North Africa, that have shown, uh, you know, some very, what I call very innovative ways of uh, engaging with the legislature. Uh, in January 2014, Tunisia ratified a progressive constitution that enabled Tunisian women secure the relevant numbers of percentage, right, in the seats of the assembly. That didn't come easy. Prior to that, you know, civil society organizations like the Tunisian Women Association of uh, Tunisia Association of Democratic Women, if you actually call it in French, it goes the other way, but the Tunisian Association of Democratic Women had worked to push for inclusion of women. And some of the lessons engaged include the fact that the importance of early mobilization. When you work early, when you move in early, um, you know, you have a long stretch. Like we say, and I think in Kuru alluded to this, it is a marathon. It is not a sprint. Engaging with the legislator is a marathon. And so the earlier you start and the more consistent you are. And we say that the, the Tunisian Association of Democratic Women recognized that the revolution that had begun to take place in 2011 meant a renewed opportunity. And this is another thing, is leveraging, understanding where the opportunity lies. A lot of legislative engagement is opportunistic. You see that the time is ripe. Many people should recall the Arab Spring of Tunisia. Uh, well, not only Tunisia, but the entire Arab world. There was a new awakening. And Tunisian women piggybacked on this and went into it. There's another example from Morocco that I will give you to as well. And uh, it was the importance of mobilization early, like we said, um, recognizing that the revolution was a new opportunity. Um, and what were the issues? You know, for them, there were several constitutional issues that they needed to address. They saw the, they read the political landscape changing. And this is what we mean by understanding the political economy. What are the drivers? What are the influences? What is happening in the environment that can create an opportunity for us or frustrate an opportunity for us? Timing is very critical. Timing is very important, and the only way you can know what time to act is by having good analysis, understanding of not only the legislature, but the political circumstances around the issues that you want to drive. What are these lessons from Tunisia that we can see? Identify and act on a shared interest builds power. And this is what I'm saying that, you know, it's not about who takes credit. They understood, they identified the share interests, worked collaboratively, and of course, that made them more potent. There is often an assumption that women will agree on certain issues. Ikiru had mentioned this, you'll be surprised. Some of the women issues that we have tried to promote in the National Assembly, you know, at times you will expect that a woman will be a driver. Not that she's not interested, but they have other priorities too. So I believe that one of the things we need to do is to, first of all, let us disabuse ourselves. A legislator is a legislator first, before she's a woman. 
you dig you you have to dig deeper to understand what are the peculiar interests of each members of the house number one they have interests from whatever background they come from they have constituency interests and when i mean constituency women in the national assembly are not voted because they are women in the national assembly they are either representing one senatorial zone or one local government and so they carry the burden of that local government as well you have to understand what are the issues there in that local government what is driving them what were the promises they made in the last session we said that this is a cycle where i mean we are moving from one the ninth assembly now i believe to the tenth so what are the new issues who are the new kids on the block what where are they coming from and what are their issues so um other lessons from Tunisia. Women in Tunisia, for example, represented various shades of political views, from conservative to liberal. ATFD worked to build understanding and even trust amongst urban and rural women through shared experiences and many hours spent together in meetings. They also worked to bring on board an influential Islamist political party, and another, which was eventually won over. The point we are trying to make here is this. First of all, we need to understand that one party alone is unlikely to gain results. You build support, you build coalitions. There are many times, take for example, the, the, the NSAS issue. The NSAS issue for me could have been better if the youth in the urban areas were more coordinated with the youth in the rural areas. At times in the urban areas, we presume that we know it all. At times we presume that some of our folks in the rural areas, or let's say for instance, in, 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 in certain states of the country, many people have accused civil society in Abuja that look, you're talking about Abuja. What is happening in, in Zamfara? You don't know what is happening in Zamfara. How does it affect us? You don't know what's happening in Bonu. You don't know what's happening in Oshu State. So we cannot but try and build understanding between the diverse interests. Many people would ordinarily take a stand on something in support of you if they were brought into the picture earlier. And this is another argument, another case for building and working early. Many people don't want to be called, called on board after you have started your movement after you have started your effort. So, and then of course, the issue of, and I believe one of the uh, points that Nkiru mentioned was that we should not be partisan in our politics. And that goes to the last point that was made about bringing an Islamist political party to drive a change. Ordinarily, it is possible for them to have just ignored that party and say, oh, it's Islamist, it may be conservative, but it took cutting and it took discussion and it took elaboration. And I believe there is, there is no group that if you do not make your case with. So the point here is that we have to make our case towards, we have to convince ourselves before we can legitimately say we want to convince the legislature. If between civil society groups, you can't build formidable coalitions, then it will be very difficult for you to have any impact in the National Assembly or in the State Houses of Assembly. The issue of Greenpeace, yeah, I know many people know, you know, you, you may not know Greenpeace, but Greenpeace is an environmental NGO that has been around for long. As a matter of fact, they are the icebreakers, they are the forerunners of environmental uh, issues. And what they've done is that they've uh, had a lot of advocacy, a lot of work about uh, you know, especially, you know, animals in the sea, like the sharks, the dolphins, you know, um, they used to call them tree huggers in those days, in the 80s, because a lot of people used to make fun of them. But now they are quite influential. And uh, why? Why is this? You know, number one, they've been around for a while. And, you know, they not only provide a number of research. The publications that Greenpeace has been able to provide, the kind of work that they've been able to do, 
has been monumental so that you cannot but notice what they have done and they have increased in the body of knowledge especially for environmental issues other techniques greenpeace uses include utilization of business and financial analysis that is they've gone over and beyond now let me just say one thing here NGOs today are not the NGOs, that's not the way NGOs were before. NGOs are becoming globalized. They are becoming more conscious. The way we are working is beginning to change. Leadership is becoming very important. Financial understanding is very important. Being able to deal with antagonistic factors is becoming more important in a way that you yourself do not appear antagonistic. And what do you do? You use evidence. You use research. It is very difficult for people to fight evidence, to fight hard evidence, because nobody wants to look stupid. So this is why the, the responsibility, right, that is the, on us is heavy when it comes to providing uh, hard evidence. Um, this issue, I, I'd like to bring this issue on Morocco. Many people uh, may not have heard about the association, Morocain, Morocain, they Planification familiar. Beg your pardon, don't let me cut my tongue in the process. But this was a very good example of how a women organization in Morocco, Morocco is an Islamic country, right? Uh, and prior to this time, the intervention, um, if a woman is raped and the person who rapes her goes back to marry her, right? The person becomes free of rape. So for a long time, women had objected to this. So the tragic case of Amina Filali, she was 16. She was raped. After she was raped, she was forced into wedlock. Unfortunately, seven months after she killed herself, she committed suicide, committed suicide during the wedlock. Now that brought out a lot of, uh, you know, of, uh, of, 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 of anger in the Moroccan population, especially women. So what they did was they organized a march called the Peace and the White March. And one of the things they did was this. They didn't just go as women. They went with doctors. They collaborated with doctors. Because doctors scientifically understand doctors treat rape patients. So they called it the peace and white uh, protest. So they introduced an entire, they brought in an entire professional cadre to drive an issue. You can see collaboration. You can see here innovation. And doctors will be on the streets and nobody will not listen to them. So the doctors joined them. But guess what? When they were doing their march through Rabat, the broken capital, it was a march nobody spoke. They kept quiet throughout. And what they were doing, they were driving the message that women suffer in silence. So they were working we we know go green, we know go green. No. So this is what we are saying that the approach we have is always context driven, must be creative. And guess what? The laws of Morocco were changed. And right now it is a crime. And you cannot be exculpated because you want to marry a woman after you rape her. Going back to Greek peace in the UK, I just said I should slot in that uh, Moroccan issue because we spoke about Tunisia. Greenpeace works behind its scene. They have a political unit. And this is what we meant, or this is what in key refers meant that we have to be more politically safe. You have to understand the politics. What is behind an issue? You know, um, many of us, we go blind into the National Assembly to have a discussion with them. And by the time those people start talking to us, we see that we haven't done our homework, especially in the politics. Greenpeace meets politicians from time to time to build political support for campaign. And this is part of what we said by identifying champions. You will be surprised that within the National Assembly, there are people who are some of you drive and yourself. 
But because of the camaraderie within colleagues, because of what I would call collective responsibility, they may not be able to show face. It is up to us to be able to identify such people. First of all, you know your issue, you are clear on the issue you want to push, you are clear on what you want to ask. Then you do an analysis of members and understand which one of them can be your potential champion. Great brings me to the politics, as we said, to support campaign, including going as far as parliament. Greenpeace is a UK establishment. And they attend all sorts of party and political uh, uh, meetings to submit, not to be members of the party, but to submit consultation, to submit documentation, to submit uh, 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 you know, information. Uh, because quite frankly, whoever you share information with from time to time is always ready to listen to you when the time comes. They also work hard behind the scenes um, uh, at a committee of practice climate conference to engage policymakers in international fora. Also, Greenpeace has uh, a purely non-violent approach. And I guess that's why they put the name Greenpeace. Uh, many of us, and this is where we have to understand confrontation. And, you see, because confrontation does not necessarily mean violence. Confrontation might mean addressing the issues headlong. Confrontation might mean going after the real antagonist. And when I mean going after, it does not necessarily mean going after him in a violent way, but facing him. So all Greenpeace's work is guided by and informed by science and research, which informs its campaigns and policy. This is what we are saying our approach will be evidence-based. No one wants to look stupid. No one wants to be confronted with clear evidence. Of course, you have some recalcitrant people. You have people who will try to excuse everything. But the more compelling your argument is, the more you re your research you have done, the more your evidence is, you will start to chip things at the seams. You will start to build coalitions around whoever may be your antagonist because not everybody wants to deny this. So um, the solution, uh, this is a Canadian uh, uh, experience. Uh, it was called the Can You Hear Me Now? Research on how different generations discuss politics and influence each other. To get involved and to consider how different generations were contacted by politicians including through what channels, traditional or digital, and the contents were discussed in 2015. There's an evaluation website of MPs. Uh, the websites are evaluated based on the availability of key information and the checklist of elected leaders are prepared to improve their websites. This speaks on ending your parliament understanding their nuances, understanding what makes them tick. Um, uh, there was a, an electoral reform debate guide that came out of this. So the guide for parliamentarians and citizens providing an entry point for Canadians, seeking high quality non-partisan information about the options for electoral reform. There was also a vote pop up, creating the voting experience by recreating uh, recreating a voting station ahead of the elections to foster interest and provide an opportunity for participants to connect their concerns and interests with the electoral process. This is a situation where civil society is even leading the space or leading the discussion. And you know, at times we get into, this is what we talk about getting early. Right now, politicians are going to, are going to start campaigning. People are going to start putting things on the table. Our question, the question I ask for all of us is that, are we going to wait, them, wait for them to determine what the issues are? Or do we use our leverage? Do we use the opportunities we have to start defining or helping to articulate what the issues are? There is no reason why civil society cannot organize its own debates for members of legislature coming in Right, even if it's in collaboration with the television stations and all, there is no reason why we cannot look back over the past five years 
and come out with a compendium of what were the thorny issues, what were the real issues that we confronted. There's no reason why we can't look forward to the next five, ten years and consider what are the issues that we are going to confront ourselves to. What are the things that we've done in the past that are completed and we're beginning to set that agenda now. The Canadian example was very important and uh, for me, they set the tone, they were able to to a very large extent determine uh, you know, the, 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 the dialogue between the citizens and the politicians. Summary of practical steps for engagement. Number one is to understand the full range of individuals and groups involved in policy making. Nkiru has said this, I don't want to belabor it too much, but um, the policy makers are beyond just the legislature, you have the legislative support and by the time you engage with the legislature, you will understand that there are other people beside the scenes. A little test I normally do is that on an issue, I count what is, who are the five most interested people? Who are the 10 most in, you know, influential people? Who are the 10 people that I may have a problem with? And then you do like a mapping. So this is about understanding the groups around any policy situation. The most effective routes to engagement may not be the most obvious. And the only way you will know is if you are engaging from many fronts. Um, as we've said, you have to choose your line of communication. So it is necessary for us to map out all the people and organizations with an influence in those policy areas. Like I've said, the most, most important five in civil society, most important five in public sector, most important five in the private sector, you map the entire space. Because you're surprised that somebody who looks innocuous, right, and very unconcerned or irrelevant may be the most influential person in a particular space. Who are the people that make the decisions? What influences the decision makers, the policy makers? Each of those legislators that we deal with, they too, they are looking for something. They too want to lobby for something else. The best way you can influence somebody is if you know what that person wants. And of course, I would like to reiterate here, we have to be mindful of the fact that we should avoid unethical behavior. Um, we don't want to blackmail people. We don't want to bribe. We don't want to, but we know that every legislature understand what is happening in his constituency. You may come to him on an issue that is gender or something different, but understand what is happening in his, those things that are happening in his uh, constituency are the things that he may be prioritizing so much so that he does not have time for you. So if you help him some of, solve some of his own issues, either by providing him data or showing empathy of the fact that you understand that he's facing other issues apart from the ones you want to drive, I bet you he's going to give you audience. Who will be implementing the policy? Because at times policies are frustrated simply because the person who we anticipate or the person who is being anticipated to implement it already has a mental block. So once you have mapped all this out, then you are ready to move. Uh, there are some organizations that have similar objectives that you can collaborate with. This is what I'm saying. Look at the case of Morocco. The women were fighting. It was a pure, it was, some people, look, if they had kept alone and stayed alone and wanted to drive that situation from women, they would say, oh, women, you come to, you know, people can be very paternalistic with women and very, 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 you know, bring them down. But they brought in the medical people. Medical people have an interest in people who are raped and people who are not raped. Why? Because they have a commitment to save lives. So when you look at the, you are driving an agenda, map out see other people who might be remotely or approximately interested in that agenda and see how you can collaborate with them. And there are some perspectives that, that will be particularly useful that you don't know. This is about listening. Who do you know that could make an introduction? That is when you want to move in to places that either told they had not known you or you want to understand a new person or a new scenario 
what can be your entry point? That's the question. What have you got to offer the people you want to engage with? And it goes back to my question, but look, okay, you the CSO, you want me to drive something on education, but are you aware that in my local government, our education is not seriously our problem? We have a water issue, and that is my own priority. A better approach would be to say, oh yes, I am aware you have a water issue, and this is one way we can help. We can provide you data, then you will listen to your issue on education. Be aware of the political context and narratives. And this, we cannot belabor this because, to be honest, a lot of things are driven by politics. The members of the legislature, they are politicians themselves. They go in cycles. They want to be able to prove something. They want to be able to do something within the four years they are there. And this is why we should understand, number one, the political cycle. Whatever we are going to engage with, we know this man has a maximum of three years. Why? Because one year, either beginning to learn, <coughs> sorry, one year beginning to learn, or the end year preparing for the next election, we, we distract him. So what's the political, political context starts with understanding the political cycle. Understanding what the issues are around the, 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 the policy change, or the, yeah, the issue that you want to, to, to change. What are the narratives around there? Take for example, if you know something is a party, is a party policy. It is strictly a party policy that a decision wants to be made. How do we influence that? We should be able to understand that, look, this is a party issue. What is the position of the opposition? Can you bring them to understand this? How do you draw it out of that? How do you make it more objective? In order to engage with the policy making effectively, we need to understand the political context, as I've said. How? What are the existing narratives around the issue? Which voices do you hear in the media? Media tracking. Are those people in power or are they in the opposition? And this is what I meant by political parties. If it is in the opposition and you push for it too much, they will label you as spokesman for the opposition. There are many times some very good civil society organizations have you know, lost their influence simply because of the fact they've been labeled members of the opposition. So it's also the strategy, and this is why the evidence has to come before the passion. Let your evidence come before your passion. So, sorry, do you have a good understanding of the political cycle? Are there moments when the political cycle is more open to change than others? When there's something happen, happening vigorously, like what we read in Tunisia, the Arab Spring, the environment made it more open to change. For Morocco, it was the strategy that made it more open. For Greenpeace, it was the evidence, the compelling evidence that made us more open to change. So the question is that what is it? What is your own trigger? What is likely to be the case? For example, the Disabilities Act that was passed a few months to the general election. A lot of people, people like David Ayele, a lot of them, made a lot of you and cry during the, that period. And a number of international things happened that brought Nigeria to the fore. It must also be easier to get things at the beginning or at the end of a political office, at the start of a new parliament, before a budgetary cycle, and not in the middle of it. And this is why we are saying understanding the political side cool is necessary. This is the time we should start setting agenda when they start campaigning. This is the time we should listen to the campaign. This is the time we should be able to force our uh, potential legislators to fix and you know deliberate on, on, on issues. It also behoves us at this time to understand what are the issues around each constituency on a zone by zone uh, basis. And I'm glad that this forum includes a lot of people from different zones. I can see, you know, as far as Zafara State, I can see Edo State, I can see Eboy, I can see Bono. You know, the issues from all these states are different. And we should be mindful of, we cannot begin to assume for anybody. 
as this cycle begins again too, the issues of last the ninth assembly may be different from the issues of this assembly. The leadership may determine it. If you go in the middle of a cycle, if you don't, we can't slam in the middle of, 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 the, of the of the political cycle and expect to get results. So one thing that if it's a takeaway that people will just take away from here is that I think NGOs should start having four, five year plans. You must have your four, five year plans. I have a plan, even if it's broad, even if it's not in detail. What are the things you want to achieve broadly? And you can't set those plans if you haven't done enough research to know what the issues are. So when you have those longer term plans, you're already piggybacking on the long term cycle. You're already preparing yourself for a marathon and not a sprint. So in summary, further summary, tell us your message for the, poli for the policy makers. That is, like in Europe, I will say, um, I, I will say it in Yoruba and then I will, <laughs> I will, if you don't mind, I will interpret it in English. It says, Bele, Olako, Olabu, which means that even if you say sorry, there is a masculine gender and a feminine gender. Your sorry might sound to somebody like an abuse. And a simple word, right, may not be taken as innocuously or altruistically as you want. So you have to understand your audience and you tailor your message in a way. And not only the message, I will add the messenger. If somebody has been seen on television several times uh, lambasting the National Assembly, lambasting the National Assembly, that is not really the ideal person that you will send to the National Assembly to go and negotiate because already you've created a bias. We should be clear in our communication, what exactly are we saying? What exactly are we asking for? What message are we trying to deliver? What are the things that the policymakers will find useful? It will also be smart to consider their priorities. And this is what I said initially, that we have to understand what their priorities are too. A National Assembly member or a State House of Assembly member will tell you that, look, it's me that I was elected, not you. It is me that the people know, not you. And some of them can be nasty enough to tell you that, look, if you want to, to, to do something, go and contest. So it is always easier understanding the person's priority because they come for a reason. And I don't want us to presume that because a number of us tend, a lot, a number of us tend to do that, that, oh, these people are just uh, they are there to eat money. No, we must go in with an open mind and an open heart. Develop and maintain networks, not only networks within ourselves as uh, NGOs and civil society. We've said it before, understand what others do that are similar to what you do, but also, uh, 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 you know, networks with professions. How do you want to drive a water, uh, access to water, water and sanitation agenda if you don't have experts, if you don't have relationships with experts in water? How do you want to drive a human nutrition agenda if you don't have uh, networks and relationships with people in human nutrition? So engagement with ourselves as NGO, engagement with practical groups within the space of the policy we want to drive, then engagement and networking within the assemblies themselves. It is not until we have an issue that we engage with the National Assembly. It was one of our fora that I was suggesting to some that look, all of us need to have some kind of publication that text speaks about our NGO and what we do. And even without being asked, we can volunteer to share this publication periodically with members of the National Assembly. The day you approach them, they will say they have not heard of you. As a matter of fact, that is one way to build trust. Because you're saying this is who I am, this is what I do. So it is very important to develop and maintain networks in order to engage with policymakers. It means meeting people 
and building relationships, maintaining your networks. So we have to sharpen our people's skills. And the primary method of sharpening people's skills is to listen. Everybody wants to be listened to. And Kiru said that members of the National Assembly have, or at least politicians have great egos. Yes, especially Nigerians. All Nigerians have big egos. But our politicians have great egos. And this is why, you know, um, we must be conscious of that. What the way you would like to be engaged if you were in the National Assembly. I will say it's like courtship. You get to know somebody first, you build that relationship, then trust sets in. Of course, there's social media there too that we have to leverage on. Social media is quite important for us. Uh, social media has become very potent and uh, a number of actors, state actors I mean, that is members of government, whether in the legislature or in the executive, have begun to use social media handles. So how do we use it in the most efficient way? One primary way we can use social media is to do research. We can use more social media for research, apart from advocacy and publicity. But we can use it for research, bring out a survey, share that survey with the National Assembly member, something that he doesn't know before. So this is a space that we haven't really explored as we, as we should. Publicize your expertise. Well, I had said it before that if you, all of us need to publish something, even if it's a quarterly newsletter or a quarterly magazine, this is what my NGO does. This is how we do it. This is where we work. And this is some of the data that we pick up while we are working. Two, three, four pages. And if you cannot be printing, and if you cannot be uh, doing all that, you can make it an online publication. Let them have it on your website. Or once you have the email addresses of the National Assembly members, you can share it with them from time to time. They have pigeon holes there that you can share with them. You do this to increase the chances of being asked for input. You know, when people see what you have done and see what you are doing on a consistent basis, number one, by providing publications from time to time, you're already demonstrating consistency in what you do. You become the go-to person when an issue arises. And once the legislator knows that, oh, where's that magazine of these people? Yeah. He not only gives his visitors, he looks at it from time to time himself. It also ensures that there is information about your organization and research and research. I've said this, uh, I don't want to belabor that. It's good to build a public profile. And this involves engaging with the media, television, radio, podcasts, and the print media. Um, everybody likes to associate with people who are known. Um, and this is one of the um, strengths of plaque. A plaque is known. And the first step of being trusted is to be known. So uh, may we not be known for the bad things. Our relationship with the media is also very critical. Mind you, uh, the media, radio, television, newsprint, uh, fourth realm of the uh, fourth arm of the realm uh, are very critical. Getting publicity for our ideas can increase awareness of the issues that we're interested in and may influence the context within which decisions are based. It can also lead to being approached by policymakers seeking input or salient issues. As a matter of fact, it comes to a time when, like I said, you will be the go-to person. Now, I've said it, we need to adopt a long-term perspective. We've said that the engagement with National Assembly, with State Assembly, is not a marathon, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. It's built with relationship and we engage in it for the long term, for the long haul. However, impact is achieved by adopting a long-term approach, including engagement activities at each stage of the research process. I've been open-minded about who you engage with and how. 
And I cannot but reinforce this question of being open-minded. Never, never, never we assume anything. The fact that the man is a carpenter because before he became a member of the House of Assembly or before he became a senator does not mean that he is not intelligent. Does not mean that he does not know. Um, uh, my grandmother would say that I may not know Buku, but I know my mind. A lot of people they know exactly what they want and they know exactly how they want to get it. Um, what we need to do is to be able to moderate what they want in a manner that is consistent with good governance, that is consistent with enriching the civic space and also can help them to achieve what they want. The only way we can do this is by being open-minded. And of course, all this takes time time for engagement. We need to focus on building relationships. We've said that before. And the particular challenge is the lack of institutional member of the National Assembly. I've said it, that about 160 members of the House of Assembly are living. Unfortunately, they were not uh, statutory delegates, and that's part of what led to uh, the scheme out of things. But uh, Bajami Amila was really, really complaining about this, which means that what is going to happen to all that we've done to the previous legislature. Somebody has that uh, institutional memory, and this is why the legislative committees, the bureaucracy in the National Assembly, you know, every assembly is very critical and most important. I think uh, of its long time, if I eventually, okay, the Electoral Act 2022 and the Disability Act 2019, which have eventually passed, did not take a day it took a long time. It took a lot of hard work. After several, several unsuccessful attempts, were they going to sign or they were not going to sign? I think it took about, I don't know, but Nkiru is in a better position to tell me how long. But we kept at it and eventually it came in. There is nothing we keep at consistently with the evidence that will not kill it eventually. So I want to thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, we will go through some questions. First of all, I will yield the floor to Inkiru again to uh, set the ball rolling. Inkiru. Thank you, Dr. Shino. Um, I think uh, perhaps we should follow the same uh, method we, 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 we took last week, you know, open the floor for questions and then you can um, okay. handle the moderation of the questions. Okay. So, so I mean, right. if anybody has a question, yes, they should just show by raising their hands or using the hand icon. Thank you. Okay, I have Sadiq Adewale here. Sadiq, please. Yeah, good, good morning, distinguished. Um, good, good morning, everyone, yeah. It's, it's really a great pleasure to be part of this session and in part of session. And thank you so much for your wonderful uh, presentation. Now, my question is this. Uh, first of all, on the, on the topic of, the, of this session, I would like to ask that, is it enough? Is it enough? When, when, when we're trying to look at the best practice in legislative engagement, it is enough to accord uh, this kind of uh, compliment to a legislature who have been in the house without, without a bill, without having a single record of a bill. And so, cause it, it, it baffles me when we see lawmaker, I quite understand that uh, the legislature is, like, is different from other arms of government. The legislature, in fact, in the legislature, you can't give what you don't have. But what, what, you know, what are the parameters? Is it, is it enough for us to accord you know, respect and kudos to it? So who, hasn't passed, who has been in the House for more than two terms without passing a bill? And another question is that what is, what is Plaque also doing in order to have more young people who are interested in bill drafting, who are, who are much interested in having these you know, legislative ideas and you know, having these... Uh, who needs support for bid drafting? Is there anything Plaque has been doing to assist such young minds? Because when we look at it, we, we really have a, a, a little number of drafters, even in National Assembly itself. And this might become a mirage so soon. 
than we think. Okay, thank you, Zadig. Very, very important question. I will answer the first one and I will leave the black one to Kiru to answer. We are aware of very many things they do with your people. Now, you are saying that <coughs> is it necessary to, is it enough to accord uh, compliments to legislators who have not uh, passed it or who have not promoted a bill since? Well, Number one, I believe that the fact that they are members of the legislature, you should, you should accord them that respect. And you give them their compliments. That's number one. You see, because they are in that seat. And uh, we are not there to judge, um, we are not there to score them. Our own is to promote uh, good governance through influencing policy. The second way I would want to ask that question is that it is not only promoting bills that the legislature does. The man may not have any bill, but he may be doing his oversights via other means. You know, being an active member of committee, challenging certain things, doing certain research, a number of people have argued that there are enough laws in Nigeria. It's a question of implementing them. It's possible to have a legislator that believes that, you know, that, uh, you know, that, uh, well, is, let us see how the legislature, the, the laws we have, let us see how they are implemented in the first place. If we start judging members of the House based on the number of bills, right, how do you judge people who produce frivolous bills every day. There are some members of the house who have bills. Some of them get to the house. And you know, you know, if you go to you know the the car park in the National Assembly. I'm not sure whether you are aware. There are some people who hawk bills there. And people go there, members of national just go, 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 take two, three, four bills. That's why some of the bills that have been thrown out and keep on getting back. They just go there and get one, two, three bills and they say that I produce this bill. So Sadiq, I quite appreciate it. Number one, let us not be judgmental. It is not our job to say who is working and who is not working. No, that's not our job. You have a policy you want to drive. As a matter of fact, if he hasn't provided any bill, any bill or he's not working on any bill, maybe he will, he's the one that's going to have time for you. Hmm. So let me let me uh, hand over to Kiru to. Okay, thank you very much. That's a very interesting question because I hear that all the time, and I, you know, I see people saying, "Oh." my legislators just sponsored just one bill or sponsored only two bills and i completely understand where you're coming from as a citizen as a nigerian as a constituent you know um of course there are metrics that people use to judge legislators and bills uh, is one of them but i would just say it is not sufficient because the have three functions, lawmaking, representation, oversight. So if the person is filling in bills, the thing is, what are the motions? So the thing is, how are you tracking the person's legislative work? The person may be moving some very critical motions uh, on the floor of the house. I know a lot of times the resolutions that are adopted by either the Senate or the house is based on a motion by a legislator. So for me, what my advice is, if you, are, if you have a particular legislator in mind, track the person's motions. What kind of motions is he moving? Um, a lot of them move motions about things happening in their community. If maybe if there's a flood, if there were killings or security problems, they move a motion. And some of those motions actually trigger um, trigger investigations. In fact, I think the full subsidy investigations that happened, I think, in the Seventh Assembly, yeah, I think they investigated like fraudulent payments. It was based on a motion that was raised by, by a legislator. So it can trigger something else that will uncover some kind of fraud or misappropriation. That's one. And then secondly, representation. For me, I think that's very key. So a legislator who is not sponsoring bills, what, um, my question, I would like to know what his constituents really think about him. For me, I think that's even the number one place, um, the number one method of 
really assess the legislator. That is why doing scorecards, I feel you have, yes, legislators can be scorched a lot of times if you have scorecards, but it can be very, you, it can be very, you need to be very nuanced about it because if you just bring out these metrics in a very academic fashion, sometimes you can miss certain things. So my question would be, what do the constituents think about this legislator? There's a legislature in the National Assembly that has come back so many times that people are complaining. I don't want to mention the person's name. Oh, this legislature has been around for so long. But we actually found out that his constituents love him. And that is why he keeps coming back. He's winning elections because he spends 70, 80 percent of his time in his village. He's not in Abuja. There are constituents whose main houses are back home. They are just renting an apartment here. You know, they are just hanging. They are not really rooted here. Likewise, there are legislators who are rooted in Abuja. They don't go home. So they can come and sponsor 50 bills, but their constituents haven't seen them since 2019 elections. So it's, it's neither here nor there. Yes, I can understand if legislators are not sponsoring bills, but that in itself is not sufficient. And again, like Dr. Shino said, this thing of parking bills, I don't know if it still happens now, but that's something we've heard happens. So um, the quality of the bill is very key. There are frivolous bills. There are a lot of people are bringing bills to set up new, uh, institutions or universities. Meanwhile, ASU is on strike and the federal government cannot pay. So for me, if you are funding or sponsoring bills where you just want to set up training institutes, universities, for me, that really doesn't make sense. If you take one or two key bills and run with it, then that's key. And then again, if um, constituents who really want their legislature to sponsor a bill can also take it up themselves. Um, it can, if you want to, if you have an idea on a bill, you can draft it and take it to his office. And that's also part of the citizen engagement and convince him to, um, to put his name to it and, and run with it. Then in terms of what is called being supporting legislative drafting, we have a legislative internship program, which we do annually. We've been doing it since 2013. And part of the curriculum of that internship is legislative drafting. And, you know, some of the interns, depending on which committee they are posted to, they do some kind of support work. And I really don't agree that we have little number of drafters. The National Assembly, that's, that's one thing I say about understanding the parliament. The National Assembly is such a huge institution. A lot of people don't know this, probably because of the quality of legislation coming out of the Assembly, and most recently the Electoral Act and all the typos. But National Assembly actually has a well-resourced back office. They have a bills department, usually headed by lawyer, lawyers. They have journals, units. they have a scrutiny department. They have a legal department made up of lawyers. I've met some lawyers, they are very, very smart. Um, then you have NILS, the National Institute for Legislative Studies. They have drafters. So they have these mechanisms. But again, like Dr. Schnell said, there's also the politics in some of these things. So if you have a bill that is very sensitive or very contentious, sometimes legislators who are sponsoring those bills, they hold it very close to their chest. They don't want to subject it to scrutiny. Um, so it can be something they drafted in their office with maybe an aide or somebody who is not very qualified. You know, they are, so the question is not just having the expertise is also them utilizing it and if they are not utilizing it a lot of times sometimes or there's a political dynamic or, or, or a, a situation um but before every bill is gazetted in national assembly the bill is supposed to actually go through scrutiny and the whole idea is to advise that legislator to say this subject area has been covered by another legislation. This is a duplication, or you would think you should package it in this way or redraft it. But the reality is a lot of them actually don't do that. And again, it still goes back to the dynamics of the institution. Our National Assembly is still evolving, it's still growing. Um, you know, that's having a real democratic parliament is, you know, it's still an ideal that we're still trying to attain. So, and this, you cannot divorce it from the Nigerian context where our democratic culture generally is still quite weak. So the same way you see gaps and challenges in the executive, you also see in the legislature. So, and I think that is where we come in as civil society, you know, to find where we can engage to help address these challenges or bring them to the fore so that uh, they can take action to address it. But in terms of um, uh, what plaque is in to support young people, we have a legislative internship program and you can learn more about it uh, on our website. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for the wonderful response. Um, I really appreciate the two, the, the you, two speakers. Yeah, with regards to the internship, we've been looking forward to this year. Own. I've been an applicant for the past three years for the legislative internship, but probably because I see myself too experience, that's why I'm not shortlisted. Because it's really, it's always been, it always baffles me why I'm not being shortlisted. I have my master's in political science and I, I do, I volunteer for state as of assembly and yet I've not been, you know, part of the intern. So if we are still looking forward to this year, I'll still give it a shot again. So very, I'm much aware about the program and, you know, Great things happening in Plaque. I'm I'm very much aware. Thank you so much for that. And uh, with you. 
Yeah, when yeah. I, when I saw that hand up, so I, did, <laughs> I knew that something was coming up. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But it's you, noted. Do you have yeah, another yeah. question? Okay, yes, I want to also point out this with the contemporary examples. We, you mentioned that you see legislators, you know, coming in yearly, you know, you know, getting elected, and you, you want to believe that they are doing well in their constituency. But, but I think that's not that's not really what is really happening. That's what you, because when you look at look at let's look at the delegate system now. The delegates are the one who you know who got this you know huge amount of fund, and then you know elect someone who hasn't done anything, but because they just have the access to being being privileged to be part of the delegate, they, they keep electing this man, they keep, you know, sponsoring this man there. And this man hasn't been, you know, been effective in his constituency. Well, 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 well um, Sadiq, Sadiq, I will have to stop you there. You know, there are um, 300 and how many in the National Assembly? 360. 360 in the National Assembly. There are 109 in the Senate. Um, we must not generalize. This is what, you know, if you have one example, and this is how we discuss the use of evidence and bring into the space open-mindedly, you have to have the evidence. And it is true. There are, there are three, you, you've, you've isolated, you, you've put, there is only one parameter that you have used to, to judge the legislature, the number of bills passed. And that cannot be, you see, because it's not every bill that makes sense, right? But there's the representation. Don't forget that the member of the National Assembly is there to represent his people. And it is the people that decide that who represents them. Now, you cannot say for certain that you know how it goes in all 360 constituencies. So, my advice was that, you know, we always start home. I said that's why we to retrain this issue. Evidence. Evidence. Park, let's park our sentiments and focus on the evidence. So if there is a particular evidence, and, it, and again, let's even look at the state houses of assembly, which is proximate to the people. That's where we should start from. You know. So I, I I agree. This issue of delegates is just is, is, I mean it's it's uh, it's uh, I would say it's a new phenomenon, but the point is that somebody is elected by a means that is recognized by the constitution. Now, even if he's a party candidate, it does not mean he has become the member of the national assembly. He still goes to the general public. So if the general public deems him the kind of person that should be represented, right? We cannot say whether he's good or bad, except we know what the, his constituency expects of him. And this is why we have to be very careful. By the time we engage and we, our, uh, we, our engagement appears not to be evidence-based, and more bordering on sentiment, we will lose our credibility, we will lose the influence. But I also get your point, and I'm sure Okiru has noted your name down for the next. Uh... <laughs> Thank you so much. I'll be looking forward to that opportunity. No <laughs> Thank you. It, it's a now, very competitive um, program, but uh, good luck. Much are we, eh? All the best. Uh, good luck for your application. Thank okay. you so much. Now, um, I don't see any questions and I'm worried. Yeah. Because it's, it's either we were so perfect in delivery or we, we, we didn't see much. But let me just um, recap a few things until I see hands. Um, we talked about best practices. And we mentioned the fact that best, what is best practice depends on the context, it depends on the circumstance. Uh, but there are standard, there are standard things, and some of these things, uh, these are the things that uh, Inkuru alluded to. Getting early, being evidence-based, ensuring that we do our research, being familiar with the political cycle. Okay, Michael's hand is up. Michael, please. 
go ahead. Michael Dawudu. Michael Dawudu, please go ahead. Oh, your hand is a ho Okay, good yeah. morning. Good morning, sir. Are you hearing, are you hearing me, sir? Yes. Uh, clearly, loud and clear. Yes, I, I want to commend your efforts for this uh, uh, output, for your delivery. You have done very well. But I am worried for our political system uh, that we have uh, monetized so much that during the last uh, presidential uh, convention of uh, both APC and PDP, mm. dollars were being used. They are not even using Naira now. They are using dollars to pay delegates to vote for a particular candidate. I understand that they vote up to $15,000 for some of these delegates. Uh, this monetization of our politics, I am worried about it. Okay. And uh, people like you who are doing a good job in uh, uh, you know, shaping the system and contributing to the system should look at this one. Should we not have laws that will penalize candidates that are paying dollars to delegates to shape their voting pattern? I am worried about this, and I, I want us to talk about it. We should not just gloss over it. The okay. entire political system has been monetized beyond reasonable reasons, and I am worried. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much, Daudu. I, and I think you make a very good point, and I don't think we should gloss over it at all. Um, there are laws regarding political financing. And I'm not sure that we have really um, dug deep into the compliance of those laws. Having said that, so, um, so one entry point. For example, so one entry point could be and Bamu is continuing to explain. Right. So one entry point may be to review the, the laws of political financing. Maybe that is something we should do. And it is now that is the best time to engage with it. Let us look at the laws of political financing. How can that law be changed if it is not adequate? What about the implementation? Can we make it an issue? Can we put it on the front burner? You know, so I totally agree with you. Um, but that is just one stage. Politicians will always spend money. Hmm. Right? Uh, but of course, there must be a limit. You can't abuse the system. We can't corrupt the system and expect to get returns. But for me, the entry point would be to look at the laws concerning political finance and engage INEC on it. Uh, we saw the elections in uh, Ekiti State. Uh, there were a couple of uh, um, cases of vote buying. I uh, would love to see whether those cases are prosecuted. On the, on the issue of the primaries, well, that is, becomes even slightly more tricky, you know, uh, because number one, uh, while we know that it happened, collecting evidence that it happened becomes very difficult. Except somebody who received wants to make himself almost like a, 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 a sacrificial lamb. But INEC, that was present in that uh, meeting, uh, I think they must have something to say. Maybe our next line of advocacy should be compliance with the political financing laws. I hope that helps. Yes. Umar Mohammed, you have the floor, sir. Yeah, um, thank you very much, um, Dr. Adeshino in Kiru, for that um, wonderful presentation. It has been an interesting one for the past hour. However, um, I have this um, issue that I believe, um, based on your expertise, you will be able to throw more light on. Um, it's on improving women political participation. Um, I, 
having worked as um, the SAGE coordinator for Kurugi State, um, we have prepared ground here, you know, um, lobbying legislatures, you know, um, carrying out sensitization across board for the people and the legislature, most importantly, to see the need why um, women inclusion is very, very important for our democracy. But unfortunately, at the national level, um, most of um, the laws we put, be, uh, bills we put before them, that would, if passed, <clears throat> will improve women political participation fail at um, the national level, you know. And to the best of my knowledge, this is the second time um, I, I, I don't know, but you know, participating in this this the second time that we have put this forward and it is failing. And the reason why it has failed, you know, most importantly is um, because of um, some cultural barriers that we've had, you know, and these barriers are coming, you know, from a very large chunk of. Uh, uh, um, the geographical location that made up Nigeria. And it is something that is, you know, we, we all understand that cultural and religious uh, issues are something that are very, very difficult to, to tackle. So moving forward, how do we, you know, battle these barriers that have been hindering with other, other more, you know, issues that are being pushed, you know, uh, um, that this religion and culture is really a barrier to. How do we keep engaging, you know, and getting more fruitful uh, uh, outputs with, with this? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Would you like to give it yes. a shot? Yes, yes, I will because um, this is very. This is a topic that is very close to my heart, and it's something that we work um, on here in Plaque. And in fact, uh, Plaque was really involved in um, advocacy on one of those five uh, constitutional alteration bills, particularly the one on special seats. That's something that we we're really, really pushing. And I think this question really is a question for all of us in the room. I mean, how do we battle the barriers you know, that you're hindering, hindering women's political participation? It's really a question that we all need to ask ourselves. We need to inter interrogate this uh, deeper. But I mean, I could go on and on, but just to uh, keep, it, keep it short and simple, I will say that um, Women's political participation, you know, the barriers, of course, like you mentioned, there are religious, there are religious hurdles, um, cultural hurdles, those things are things that you can't dismantle overnight, they take time. But in terms of the advocacy and the billing question, I will say we have not really interrogated the, interrogated the issue. I think a lot of people, even within civil society, and I think the work really has to start from us as civil society, because even when we start pushing that bill, we, we got some opposition from even within civil society, pushing some of those gender bills. It took a while before others came on board. And I remember Dr. Shino saying the same thing, that people, you know, it's good to join a movement in the beginning. Don't join when you've gone very, you've gone very far before. That is, you need everybody on board. Um, people really don't interrogate it. They think, you know, they, I think they take it in a very episodic, in a very surface manner. They don't understand how it's really, really tied, again, to our politics, to our history. Um, and there's this sense that women don't participate, and that is not our history. You know, in Nigerian history, women participate in public life. So these are things, you know, that change, you know, with, you know, colonialism, with military rule, political parties didn't have the opportunity to, to really develop. And so most of them don't, really don't know how to actively recruit women they are not inclusive so it's 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 something that has to be learned um and it's something we citizens really have to um um push them to to implement but i think even we as civil society you know we really also have to uh, bring our knowledge up to speed um affirmative action is still not very popular it's not it's unpopular in nigeria um a lot of people don't understand why affirmative they don't understand the why they don't understand why women are not winning elections. They don't understand, you know, that you know the system, the structures, you know, are skewed against women. Um, you know, we've seen how the primaries played out. 
So the reason why people are pushing for affirmative action, you know, really is to just bridge that gap. Is to bridge that gap. It's supposed to be a form of remedial measure. It's not supposed to be there for all purposes. So I think that understanding is really lacking. It's lacking in the community. And really, if as a community we are not convinced about it or we're not really educated, then how do we um, convince legislators? So, like my colleague will always say, you have to be a believer first. You have to sell something to yourself. You have to sell it to your constituency before you go out and convince people. Yeah, if we are not able to sell it, or if as a group we're not able to mobilize strongly, um, then we'll have a problem convincing uh, people who have political decision making power. This, like, like I said, this is for me is a, a completely different section. So let me not uh, uh, go off and stop talking. But um, again, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And I will say, don't give up. You know, I know the work you do with Sage, and we imply for us, we just see it as a temporary setback, and it's an advocacy that we are going to be bringing back definitely because you know for us it's not over till it's over thank you very much ikiru for that um clarification thank you ikiru um let me just add umar because uh, it's a critical issue number one i think we are not leveraging on women voters you see because there is one thing women in elected women appointed women that's one side of it what about the women voters i am not sure whether we are sensitizing women voters enough and for me i think that's where the gap is we do a lot of things training women on how to get into elected and how to get but women are, when it comes to voting women are a very powerful majority when it comes to voting so i, I think that as much as much as we talk to the we encourage people to be elected we should also give some time talking to women voters and an entry point may be the issues they carry mobilizing women voters because it is the voters that are elected and i'm not sure how many how much attention we pay to the voters another thing we know and this goes back to the question that michael Dowdu a race on the issue of uh, campaign financing, right? One of the ways that they use to exclude people is, is money, by monetizing the situation. Some of the parties have done a few things to be able to lower cost of forms, lower this, which is fine. But I know some women who said, no, they are gonna pay exactly what the men are paying. And I give them credit for that. I'm not against lowering the costs. Finally, what I will say on this issue is that since we've been asking questions here, no woman has asked any question. And <laughs> I will, uh, uh, see, and so this is, I will encourage uh, women folk on the platform to please respond to questions like this or ask their own questions. Afam Kasim, you have the Okay, good morning. Uh, thank you, Prof, for the presentation. Okay, um, as uh, persons with albinism and representing persons with disability, I, like we all know, the high cost of uh, uh, purchasing form for vying for political offices in uh, uh, major political parties and even the smaller ones. I because uh, that's sort of a kind of amount of money uh, persons with disability might not uh, be able to uh, raise such form to purchase just form to run for any political office. I want to suggest, suggest if it's going to be possible for us to a civil society to advocate to the National Assembly to see how they can, as it's done in some, some other African country uh, for persons with disability, a particular number of seats can be reserved for persons with disability and to be contested by them, not by any other person. They will contest for these votes, they will vote for this. Uh, uh, post. I think if our National Assembly can go in that way, 
then you will get persons with disabilities uh, participate in electoral process the more because nothing about us without us. If you want persons with disabilities, for instance, to contest with others, let uh, seats be reserved, number of seats be reserved for them, for them, and they will contest for these seats. So I think we can uh, be able to legislate that with the National Assembly so that they can be able to put that in the uh, electoral act as we are amending it. Thank you. Thank you, Kazim. Well, um, if you listen to Nkiru, uh, I, I am aware that Plaque was at the heart of trying to drive affirmative action. What you are suggesting is an affirmative action for persons with disabilities. Uh, Plaque tried to drive the affirmative action, which most of us know what happened uh, regarding representation of women in parliament. Um, but the issue with affirmative actions is that the law says that everybody is free to contest. Now, we know that although the law says it is free for everybody to contest, some people are either purposely disadvantaged or by circumstances are disadvantaged. The women even young people are persons with disabilities. So while we will not stop on affirmative action, we need to produce some, number one, we need to produce some evidence, right? That, um, if, because take for example, the first evidence that was produced concerning women was that they didn't have access to money. So they reduced money for women. The same thing can be done with persons with disabilities. Having said that, I want to look at this thing as a more longer term thing. Um, anything that is affirmative action in this regard will, uh, and it is my opinion, it may be temporary. I think what we should do is to build the uh, capacity of people with disabilities to be able to represent both people with disabilities and people without. Who says a person with disabilities cannot represent me? Is the you know it's 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 what they bring to the table, and in any way we we you know uh, 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 you know not all of us. I mean nobody. I don't. I have not seen anybody who is perfectly able before. Some people are disadvantaged, yes. So we should look at both the short term and the long term. I think it is good we should drive for affirmative action for persons with disabilities. I know there are some states that the governors appoint at least persons with disabilities. There are groups with persons with disabilities. I have not seen them come to lobby before. Associations, as a matter of fact, a friend of mine was the chairman uh, Mr. Oshibodu, you know, particularly wealthy fellow, and they donate all sorts of things and spend some money. And I think it is high time that, just as Nkiru said, we in a particular space, let's talk to ourselves first, right? And let's talk to ourselves based on evidence. There are associations of people live, uh, with disabilities that don't have anything to do with politics. But they can become a lobby group. We can also extend partnership with others. And of course, in our respective constituencies, the way the constitution is configured is that members of the House of Reps or members of the Senate, they represent a particular constituency. The constitution does not constrain you to either pick a man or a woman or a child, it does not exclude you too from picking a person with disabilities. Do you follow me? So what I'm saying in essence is that we will do a long, the long haul is by actually making our case beyond affirmative action. The short term is to put an affirmative action. 
but I think, uh, I think, like we said, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint, and we wouldn't stop here. Thank you very yeah. much, Alpha. Yeah, thank you. So I've been getting uh, indications to, for us to round Grand up. Yes, because we've now gone beyond, I think, um, the stated time. I know we didn't start immediately um, at 10 as, as planned, but I think it's time to round up um, since a lot of us have been on this call for two hours now. So um, I think um, you are supposed to feel, I think participants are supposed to fill an evaluation form. Um, the link to the form is uh, in the chat box. So please kindly uh, go to the link and give us your feedback uh, on this session. And um, I think I'm just going to say, um, on behalf of Black, thank you very much. I don't know if Brenda or Lara was to, has any closing remarks, but I think from my own end, um, I'll just say thank you very much uh, for participating in this webinar. Brenda, um, any closing remarks, Brenda? No, just, or Lara? To, just to reiterate what you've said, to say thank you. Just to reiterate what you've said, to say thank you. And to also thank USAID strengthening civic advocacy and local engagement. USAID scale that has provided this platform. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you for your questions. Uh, we'll, we'll actually share this webinar uh, for future reference on um, Flag social media handles. Please, if you haven't filled the attendance form, please, the link is actually on the chat box. We would also like to hear feedback from this webinar to see how we can further engage with you. Uh, so kindly also fill the evaluation. Uh, I'll be on for the next five minutes uh, so you can have access to the attendance form and the evaluation form before I finally end it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.